morning, Fellowship Church. Welcome to Sunday School, adults. If you please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. As we continue going through this book, which shows us a divine sequence, a constant, not a variable, starting with prayer, power, proclaiming, and persecution. We'll see this sequence today, as we will in one way or another in every chapter of the book of Acts. I'll start out with a word of prayer. Lord God, just speak to our hearts. Bless us or convict us, but don't let us be neutral around your word, that it may be powerful because prayer has been preceding it, that it may help us to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ and be prepared in case we're persecuted. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Acts is a book of transition. Unless we get this transitions, we're not going to understand what is constant in Acts throughout it and it applies to today and what is a variable. It applied for then, but it doesn't for today or could at some places and times, but not for the whole church. It's important to get these transitions. And I will go through them. The first is we're transiting from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Apostle Peter in chapters 1 to 12. Jerusalem is center in chapters 1 to 7. Also, Jerusalem and Judea, according to Acts 1.8, you shall be my witnesses and the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And today we begin a section known as spreading the gospel from the 12 apostles to seven non-apostles, from 12 Hebrews to seven Hellenistic Jews in chapters 6 through 8. That's an important transition as we see um, going from Jewish to Greek. And two of the prominent ones will be Stephen or Stephen, either way, most properly Stephen, Second, Philip, and then we'll talk a little bit about the last of the seven, Nicholas, today. I got a little map here that talks about the locations. Chapter 6 and 7 are going to be in Jerusalem, the green part around there, but it could be more. Chapter 8 is going to start spreading to Samaria and into Gaza, or the Ethiopian. So we're going to see chapter 6, 7, and 8 as that spread of the gospel through these Hellenistic Jews. And we're going to spend our time going through the 13 verses in chapter 6. Yes. Right now. This is one day, it all happens in one day, chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. It's all in a short period of time within a day. It's a few months after chapter 5. So a period of time and location, where are we? And we'll go to chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And in those days, that means it's a period of time, uh, weeks, months, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, they were multiplying over and over again in Jerusalem. There arose a murmuring. Okay, this word murmuring is usually associated we shouldn't murmur. But there's two ways to look at murmuring or complaining. One is it's from the flesh, it's not valid. Another is, it's a valid murmur. This is actually happening, 
and needs correction in the local church, which Jerusalem was all one big church at this time, many synagogues where they met at. So of the Grecians against the Hebrews. So we see here different languages. They were both Jews. Some were Hebrew and some were Hellenistic or Greek. The, this is not a racial difference. This is an ethnic difference. According to God, we're all one race. Coming from Adam, or later on from uh, the three sons of Noah, we're all one race genetically. But ethnically, we have different preferences for food, for music, for uh, cultural things, holidays, our customs, our culture. That's where we're different. And they had those differences here. They were all believers, Christians in the early church. And because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration, we see the setting here. And they had a valid consent, consent um, a valid complaint or murmuring. They were telling the truth, not like chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they were mixing truth with lie. And what happened to them? They died. They're not going to die here. There's something positive, something good's going to happen because they're complaining about the right things that should be dealt with in the church. The church, to be the church, has to deal with difficult things that may not be popular or we just have to realize this is happening and then deal with it. And this is how they dealt with it, and this is a constant this remains the same, it's applicable today, what we'll learn how they dealt with it in the early church. Then the twelve, twelve apostles, called the multitude of disciples. This is the first of three times in verses 1 to 7, they're known as disciples. That means discipline of life, disciplining our bodies and our minds. Without discipline, where is the wind that's tossed about by the sea in our soul, in our heart? It gets contaminated easy. We get um, sidetracked easy without disciplines of the Christian life. So they were disciples. That's the most common name besides brethren that's used for the church in the New Testament, in the, the book of Acts, I should say, the book of Acts. And brethren is a general term, means the men and women, everyone that came to Christ, but disciples is specific, has that, um, that the master plan of discipleship is by Jesus Christ himself. When he discipled the 12 apostles, but also the 70 disciples, we'll go later where he sent 12 out, then he sent 70 out later, and the 120 in the upper room, they were disciples. <clears throat> It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. They were putting a priority on their time. What's most important is the apostles having that trust of the and teaching of Jesus Christ. They knew the word of God was most important. They had to give their time, time management, and each of us to learn, manage our time. That will be effective and useful. They were looking at that. So what? Wherefore, brethren... Look ye out among yourselves seven men. That's the first of four qualifications. They were men. They needed leadership in the early church, besides the twelve. So they, one is men. The next one that's really the most important is honest report. They are known for their honesty. Not half-truths like Ananias and Sapphira, and not trying to get their own advantage in the church, but honesty. Honest report. Then the second, third, is filled with the Holy Spirit. As Ephesians says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, not with wine. And the third, wisdom. So those four qualifications. And they asked the multitude of disciples. And they said, because they had been together several months or a year, uh, 3,000 got saved, Acts 2, then Acts 3, the 4, 
5,000, maybe some of the same ones uh, were refilled with the Spirit or, or believed. And they, were, they just kept multiplying in Jerusalem. So the multitude were together making this decision. Now, is this a, a variable or constant in, in church government? I don't know yet, but let's see what it says, because we get to learn about local church government or church government through what's happening here. It's an example. And how do we apply it? Who may, we may appoint over this business, the business of the church. Verse 4, but we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That sequence is important. They knew the importance of putting prayer even before the word. Because someone that teaches or preaches, or even us that proclaim, share the truth with others, prayer is the thing that gives the power, that gives us wisdom, praying to God alone, at times with others. So our prayer lives, and they put that first, prayer and to the ministry of the word. The ministry of the word will be teaching, helping others understand, making correct judgment, uh, understanding what sin is in our lives, helping us to have our hearts right, different things where we, we uh, to grow in Christ. The ministry of the word helps other believers grow in Christ, and Christ in them. Very important, verse 4. Verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And that's amazing how this just seems so right, not if we asked everyone pleased and a uh, whole multitude, you may have a lot of variation. And this pleased them all at that time. And the saying pleased them all, and they chose Stephen, or Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. So he was known. Number one of the seven is put number one because he got the most popularity. He was most known for these things of being honest report. He was out in the community doing the right things as a disciple. And according to uh, God's gift or the will of God, in the center, in the high calling of God, each one of us, Paul says, pressed toward the mark for the high calling of God. And if we be otherwise minded, he shall reveal it to us. Isn't that a blessing? That's a promise when we're other-minded. And Stephen was in the center, the high calling of God, and everyone was apparent. Then the second is Philip. These two are going to continue and really become prominent in chapter 7 and 8. Stephen and Philip. Then other Greek names, Procurus, Nicanor, and Timon, and Paramias, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now, these are all Hellenistic Jews' names. They're not Hebrew names. They're Greek names. So they got the people that understood the culture and their mannerisms. There's ways of speech. It's like I say, I, I listen to Puerto Rican preaching every Sunday morning from a church in uh, Puerto Rico. And just their mannerisms and styles is different. But since living there 23 years, I understand it. So these Greeks that were in leadership positions now to help the apostles understood. That's why they selected those of their same ethnic background. The last one, though, I want to point out, his name is Nicholas. And he's not... Only a Hellenistic Jew, it says. He's the last of the seven, so he was the least popular. So what about Nicholas? He's a proselyte. He's, he was converted to, he was uh, other gods before. He wasn't raised or that more than away from God. Other gods, the Greek gods, he was a proselyte to Judaism. And what else? Of the city of Antioch. That's up north, the capital of a region, a large city. He had a background that was really different from the others. Why might this be different? In the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, two of the churches talk about uh, 
the sin of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. In history, historians say this person later left the faith. The Nicolaitans had a doctrine that the Jesus said, which I hate, in the first church of Ephesus, in the third church of Pergamos. And the third church was a time, what does um, Nicolaitans mean? It means controlling or rule over the people. And we know the Middle Ages, the church ruled over the people, the government and church combined from four or 500 to 1500 before the Reformation. They were in that position. So that was something the Lord hated, and this is uh, the person that the historians relate, that what does this mean to us? A person can be selected and even laid hands on and ordained, but they can go astray. That's why we have to watch ourselves, guard our hearts, and continually be in the word, and others, not just ourselves. He was a leader at the beginning, but most likely, he's started the Nicolaitans, which Jesus says, I hate their doctrine. So a little, hand, little lesson there. Verse 6. No other names were related. And actually in history, Irenaeus, a historian, and I think it was, uh, I forget the other ones, but the historians that are well recorded that they were from him, that Nicholas. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So they laid their hands and recognized what the people said. These are the people that we want to solve, give the solution to this problem in the local church. And it was a good solution. And it worked. What happened? Verse 7, the evidence. And the word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And also a great company of the priests came to know, who were that group that ministered in the temple daily. A great number of them came to, what? Be obedient to the faith. Doesn't talk about being baptized or speaking in tongues or nothing else. They became obedient to the faith. Another way we can put, they were saved. They were added to the body of Christ, to the church. What else about these seven? Why seven? It is a perfection number. But here I'll give you a few ideas because uh, really there's four. The seven and the council. The council is the Sanhedrin who were the leadership of Israel. They're the Supreme Court. When Moses back in Exodus, he couldn't handle the load. And his father-in-law spoke to him. He said, select 70 and help. they will help you. They'll take care of the minor things while you take care of the bigger things. 70. The Sanhedrin were made of 71 persons. They were um, the Pharisees, they were elders, they were priests. They were the what was it, Sadducees, those type, Hebrews. Okay, we got that... Uh, church government, um, governing God's people. But also we see hints of it in Matthew when Jesus feeds the 5,000. First he feeds 5,000. How many baskets were left over? 12. When he feeds the 4,000, how many baskets were left over? Seven. And the seven, the first one was more to... Uh, Jewish population. This other one, he just uh, healed a Canaanite woman's uh, daughter. And he was more towards the Gentiles. So that seven left over, that's one. Then we look at Luke, chapter 9 and 10. He sends out the 12 first, only to Israel. No one else makes it very clear. When he sends the 70 disciples out in chapter 10 later, he sends it to everyone. So divide 70 by 10, maybe you got seven. Then there's one other thing with the, the Jews. They call them Hasidic Jews, their tradition. 
and I don't go by this too much, so this is low priority. But those around Galilee, the northern part of Galilee, were known as the Hasidic, the real observant Jews. And that was known as the Twelve, the area of the Twelve. Then the Seven is down in southern Galilee to the east, and it's called the, the Decapolis. And there were Jews and Romans in the, the ten cities, and it was known as Seven, so that really doesn't matter. But there were seven chosen. That was the appropriate number. And I think it was there because they were Grecians. It doesn't hurt if we believe this. There's reasons why things are done. They're leaving the Jewish church in Jerusalem, the apostles. They're now switching over to non-apostles, to Hellenistic Jews, that transfer. <clears throat> Let's go to verses... 8 to 15, the first of the elders, or we call them, sometimes they call them deacons. I don't call them nothing. They're leaders. And whatever God wants them to do, they're going to do. Whether you want to call them elders or deacons, it's according to the will of God what will happen to them. And their own choice, too, such as the Nicolaitia. So let's see what happens to the first name when Stephen is arrested. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. He was doing just the same as the 12 apostles. That was God's will for him. Not all the ones were doing that, only Stephen. Then there arose certain of the synagogue. Synagogue. There were several synagogues in Jerusalem. That's where they met in small groups of men, 10 or more. They were all, but this is a certain one, a specific one, which is called the Synagogue of the Libertines. Libertines are ones that most likely it's they were slaves under the Rome, and they were set free and allowed to go back. One of the emperors allowed all the slaves to go back to their homeland. So freedmen, liberty, libertines, not libertarians uh, as we have today. And Cyrenians and Alexandrians, other than of Cilicia of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So Stephen's talking, proclaiming the truth, and they're disputing. Do we, this is something we can expect at times. Not everybody's going to really say, oh, I'm glad you told me that. There'll be disputings. And what does he do about this disputing? I think this is important to understand as uh, we see his testimony because he's the first of the martyrs. He's the first to, to die for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the gospel. Verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they suborned which is bribery, men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. Someone that's evil will stir up others to follow them. They were um, bribery. I don't know if it was financial or some type of gain. They said, you do this and they made up this stuff, they would be selectively out of context talking about Jesus destroying this temple in three days and it shall be rebuilt. They didn't leave the how to understand that. <laughs> and about Moses, you could say the law of Moses or the Sermon on the Mount where he said it used to be this way, now it's this way on the New Testament. They were blind. They didn't understand none of this. They were locked up as old bottles under the old wine. We're called to be new bottles that we can receive the new wine today. And anyways, that's my theme personally for this year, each day, to be that new bottle, this body, this mind, to receive the new wine, the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, and they stirred up the people. We did that. 13, and they set up false witnesses, liars, 
which said, This man ceased not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth, identifying him of Nazareth, northern Galilee, shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. They, were, they had their traditions, their customs, their culture, which they didn't want to break away from. They were comfortable in. So they're causing resistance to Stephen, who's speaking the truth, the New Testament truths. And all that set in the council, the council is the Sanhedrin, which we covered the 70, the capital of Israel is Jerusalem, looking steadfastly on him and saw his face and it has been the face of an angel. So had they actually seen a, an angel? There's angels, there's good angels and evil angels. They were all good at first, but then they left their first place after the deception of Lucifer, and they fell. And they will never get back being a good angel. So the evil angels, is, so this is his face shine as an angel. So, how would this be, his countenance, his face? Because of the presence of God, but the Holy Spirit was filling him. And as we become more obedient, his, uh, imagine his face was there was a purity, there was a simplicity, there was a wholeness, complete a contentment. Even though this was a fearful circumstance, they were disputing. Was he worried about what was going to happen? I think he had a good idea where it was leading to, which we'll get into next week in chapter 7. Marvelous message of Stephen. And they saw his face that has been the face of an angel. And that's where I'm going to stop. What was Stephen doing? These are three words which really helped me. It was uh, uh, one of my commanders when I was in the military, and we get and give presentations and, and talks before the leadership. And he gave me this thing, which really helped me. It's, and it, it rhymes in English. It means stand up, speak up, and sit down. And that's what he was doing. He was standing up for the truth, speaking up, and then sitting down. That sitting down is the important part. Because you don't continue the battle, you're trusting the Lord to do the battle for you. Or you're just uh, a place of patience and rest, waiting, because you did your part, standing up and speaking up. And to recognize when that time comes in your life. The Holy Spirit blesses or convicts as we obey him, and, and uh, especially in doing what's good and right. Not just witnessing, such as... Remember the poor man outside the temple and they gave to him? And uh, Brother Phil was teaching, you know, when we see someone that's poor. Last week I went to a shopping center and it was spontaneous. I had to, I always keep, now this is, we personally, we should do this, be ready to help the poor. And uh, I had a, in my car, I always keep in the center, to know who to give to, but it was spontaneous. This guy that was seemed very needful, and, and I just had it, and I said, oh, yeah, here it is, spontaneous, natural. It's not forced. And if I would have missed it, I would have missed a blessing to give to others. The same with witnessing or telling the truth, what's right. You see something that's unfair, and you don't stand up and speak up. The Spirit lets us know, the Holy Spirit in us. And even if we're not saved, the conscience of a person will let them know that this was right, this is wrong. So us, even more, that have the Holy Spirit in us, that is leading us and, and helping us do what's right. It's a great helper, a great comforter, which John calls this Holy Spirit. And I'll say at this... I'm going to have a few minutes for questions, as things may have occurred in your mind or heart as we are talking about Acts 6. We see things about church government, uh, decision-making from the, the leaders. They're the, that's the church being the church. 
and we should uh, expect that and strive for it. Uh, what else in this section? If you were doing the daily quiet time schedule, Act 6, you would have, uh, Saturday you start in Act 7 and throughout all next week, you would be reading a small portion of Act 7, which we'll go over next week. So the next six months, the daily quiet time schedule, there's an extra one on the table there. If you're doing it, that's the intention, the purpose, that we're reading ahead. We're thinking about what's going to be taught. And we can challenge, we can accept, we can be blessed or convicted because these words are, are words from uh, a person, myself, but I believe they're, they're powerful and they're to be effective. To have, there's a purpose. When we come to church, when we hear the message and, and the teachings, whatever age, the children's church, the, uh, the Sunday school, the different ages, and the Lord's going to uh, bless us as we take his word dead seriously <laughs> and the fear of the Lord. And he will bless us uh, individually and corporately as a local church. I think I covered that pretty well, but let's see. Chapter 6, before we get any questions on chapter 6. Yes, Jim. The one you saw about the, uh, the, the deacons. Or we call them deacons at times, uh, yes. I would never see, see the deacon thing as just holy people. Because in Timothy chapter 3, it talks about deacons being a husband or one wife. So holy people who live by it, the people are moved by the Spirit of God. Leadership position. Yes. But they were more important than just the average person in the church. Well, see, in the book of Acts, things are developed in leadership. Such as you mentioned, 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy, talks about the elders and the deacons. So it's more developed there. It isn't developed here. This was fitting the need, and whatever you want to call it, and even if it's an elder or deacon, these, are, I think, are the right criteria for leadership in the church. Men filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom and of a good report, honest report. Those criteria haven't changed. If they're married or not, doesn't matter either. But um, most likely God's will is most men be married and have a family. But can you give some more background again about Nicholas? Nicholas, the uh, proselyte from Antioch. Okay, church historians, and this is where you get the, go into the commentaries, because I didn't know this myself. So part of studying, I go into each person and say, hey, what can I get of this? And he's the last chosen. So commentators in the first and second and third century pointed out that this is the same Nicholas that developed the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, where they were controlling the people. Instead of we the people, which is a biblical, such as all the multitude chose them. But sometimes things don't go right, such as Judas, one of the twelve. And, but God has a purpose, an overall plan. We can rest in and trust him. So. Yes, Wayne? That's from Alexandria in Egypt. And sometimes we associate cities with different things, such as Antioch. That's a good city. That's where Paul set up his uh, headquarters later on in chapter 9 for a long time, Antioch. But um, it doesn't have no significance. They were just from there.
you may, and uh, there were some of the, these from the synagogue of the Libertines, and these people, some were from the north, above Israel, and some were from the south, but they were all Hellenistic Jews. The Greek Empire really influenced them. And those that study the, the difference between the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, and the Hebrew religion and people, sometimes we make too much of the Greeks' influence, especially in the Nazareth, the village of Nazareth, in Galilee, the northern parts. And sometimes we make too little. The theologians will go back and forth, but we don't need to be involved in that. We're not theologians, and um, we want to live the truth. <laughs> So these are little things that we could go off in tangents, but I don't think nothing else is meant here. But we don't know nothing about them, just their names. They're never mentioned, the other five. So they're, they're, they're a name, and we assume they did well and trust they did, except for this one, the Nicolaitans, Nicholas. Tangent? <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure, sure. But raising up people to uh, accuse you falsely? Did Stephen get accused? Did, when you're falsely accused, this is one thing uh, starting out with Stephen, and he's going to be arrested. Uh, he's not trying to defend himself, what he's saying. Neither is he offended. Very important lessons. When we're standing for truth and what's right and we know it, we don't need to be offended. We don't need to be defend ourselves either. Just continue on. And that's what he's going to do in chapter 7. It's a beautiful message and sermon. Okay, last slide. Oops. <laughs> Did it go back? Not yet? Oh, I went that to the beginning. There he's going to get it. Next one. There. We did the questions, the first martyr. And I'll, I'll leave you with this. Hebrews 12.4. It says, Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against what? Against sin. <laughs> you know, some, I've been accused at times or, or by a, Unbeliever, oh, you think too much of sin. You always think everything's sin. Well, that's what we strive against, and that's what I want to be victorious over. Not just for myself, but for others, in loving them as Christ loved them, knowing how to deal with the different sins that we're going to face, that we can sin less and less. Not sinless. We sin with less severity and less frequency. Then we're perfected when we go to be with Christ, when we die or put off this body. Face the judgment seat of Christ. We did finish on time, and uh, God bless you all. And may the Lord be with us during the... He is with us. We don't have to pray it. He is with us. Uh, bless the music and the message this morning.
Can you hear me now? How about now? All right. We want to welcome you to Fellowship Church. And uh, at this time, we're going to look at our prayer list. And I want to mention, can you hear me now? Shh. Can you hear me now? All right. I want to mention that your giving records, are they're giving them out and they'll be at the end of the service back on the table on the right on the way out. And uh, be sure to pick those up. I want to mention several names to you and we have a name right here. Uh, right now. <clears throat> we have a friend Jason Lusby, Jason Lusby. And uh, whose dog fell through uh, 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 steps, staircase. staircase, about two stories, and uh, the dog is actually in the hospital here. And his uh, master asked if we would pray for the family and that their dog that they love right now. We do pray for that, the Lord Jesus. Also, I want to mention Wes James, a young man that comes here. Should be here in a few minutes. He uh, uh, has had several physical problems uh, earlier last week. Praying for him, Oroko Nod, uh, praying for her. Also, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Garnett Anderson and uh, Melissa Seacrest. Also uh, looking at uh, Michael Turley, Chloe Saw. Uh, Ken and Lorraine Mahan, Ella Mason, and Evan Mason. Also for Lydia Witten, Betty Stepp. Good to see Betty here today. Amen. Uh, Jimmy Ryan, Dan Duty, Billy Laracy, uh, Tommy Harris and family. Uh, Sherry Greenhow, praying for uh, Myron. Good to see Myron back today in the back, passing out flyers. Uh, Charles and the Newman family, also uh, Ed and Debbie Roberts uh, doing very well, and uh, both had, uh, one had the operation, and uh, she did, and uh, Debbie had some problems, maybe a, a light stroke, I believe, but they're both doing great and at home. Uh, Danny and Carolyn praying for them. Jim Bowie had an operation this week, he's at home doing well. Kimberly Harris, Jim Heath praying for his salvation, Paul Fitchner, also Zoe Strong, Ashley Enstrom and her son. A wonderful uh, testimony this morning from Ashley about her and her son doing so well. And John and Rose Burnham, Janice Haig, uh, also Lorraine Beringer's family, Joey and Mary, Savannah, amen, also uh, Angelo and Cheryl. Judy Crawford, another answer to prayer. Back home and in church with us. Also Jan Bice, Tiffany, uh, Joseph uh, and Kelly and the family. Uh, Jerry and Linda Muchow. Also uh, John Boer, Maureen Cowie, uh, Kimberly Martin. The Malberg family, I understand that uh, Sarah may have a job in Florida as a nurse, and also uh, Myron's Aunt Shirley, remembering her, the Adgate family, uh, Steve and Brenda Sears, praying for them and her uh, son and his new wife and their four children. I understand all of them in North Carolina have the COVID, praying for them, Butch Lysinger, uh, Dale Hayes, Robert Pickle, uh, also, uh, Mike Winston, Ginger Konigan, Debbie Boer, uh, also for Dory Hardesty, my wife's sister, going to have a shoulder replace, replacement this coming Monday, and her other shoulder, she broke both shoulders, uh, they're going to put a pin in that shoulder. Uh, also, my wife Donna is going to have an operation on her one arm in uh, March. Christina Crown and family 
a blessing. Uh, uh, she was bad into drugs, crack, and different things, and they sat up here on the front with us. She got saved recently, and so did her fiance. This is a real blessing to me. They've been uh, over 120 days clean. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and they want to get married here right after the church service, February 20th. And I believe you're all invited, so that's going to be a real blessing. And they're doing so well. I'm so proud of them. And uh, the evidence of the change of the Holy Spirit is is amazing in their lives. Uh, just praying for them. And also Marissa, uh, their uh, daughter, and uh, the Kachesky family, praying for them. And also, um, let's see here. Um, I want to remember, uh, good to see Rose Younger here today. Amen. A lot of our people back. Uh, Jim Queen out of the hospital. Diane Labonte and her sister. Uh, Mary Jo Thompson. Uh, Anthony uh, Antonio Lyle praying for him today. And uh, the, those that are recuperating from surgery, Dave Beam. I believe he's doing very well now. And, of course, Andrea and Linda Parr, praying for them. And, again, remembering several of our friends that have lost loved ones recently. Uh, uh, the Tyron Carroll family and the Patrick Bowie family. Also, uh, our friend Tom Stamp, who passed uh, recently, praying for those families. And, uh, and also... Uh, Billy Bott and his family, praying for them. And uh, uh, Aaron Beavers, adding him to the prayer list, who has COVID and he's in ICU. Uh, we love you, Lord Jesus. And we know you answer prayer. And I'm so thankful that all things work together for the good for those that love the Lord. And we just pray for a special day today. I pray each person here is encouraged today. In your name, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for our visitors and our friends that have come out today. And we thank you for the blessing that uh, the fact that uh, we've been able to stay open and never closed since the COVID started. Uh, we have did meet outside for a while, but we're back inside. And uh, I thank you for our people and our loved ones and our friends that have helped us. And I'll ask all these things in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, Ray, are you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you, all right. Pastor Marvin. Good morning, Fellowship Church. And we welcome those who are joining us um, virtually this morning. Please stand with us and uh, let's worship the Lord together. Let's lift our voices, um, singing praises. Bless the Lord is our first, first song. You give and take away, oh my good, for who am I to say what I need? For you alone see the hidden parts of me that need to be stripped away. And as you begin to refine, I'm learning to let go and rely on one who walks with me as hard as it may be. You're teaching me all the while to say. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh that's in me, bless your name, forget not your power untold, not your glory or your fame, for you came to kill the broken, to redeem and make me whole. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. You give and take away my good, 
for who am I to say what I need? For you alone see the hidden parts of me that need to be stripped away. And as you begin to refine, I'm learning to let go and rely on one who walks with me as hard as it may be. You're teaching me all the while to say, bless the Lord of oh my soul. Oh, that's it, me, bless your name. Forget not your power untold. Not your glory or your pain, for you came to heal the broken, to redeem and make me whole. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Though my faith may falter, my strength may fail, I pray for us to see the riches of your mercy showed to me. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh that's in me, bless your name, forget not your power and soul, not your glory or your fame. For you came to heal the broken, to redeem and make me whole. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All oh, that's in me, bless your name. Forget not your power untold, not your glory or your fame. For you came to heal the broken, to redeem and make me whole. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I'm Was grace that taught my heart to hear, and grace my peace relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My Savior has ransomed me, and life. 
Let them flood His mercy reigns Unending love Amazing grace The Lord has promised good to me His word my hope secures He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains of gold I've been set His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon be soft like snow, the sun forbear to but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine. You forever mine. Oh, great God, and gracious, loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you once again for the good night's rest, for waking us, waking us up this morning to be here in your house to praise you, to lift up the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this week, and we thank you for preserving us and protecting us. And now we ask that as we come before your throne of grace, Lord, make us worthy to worship you. Open our eyes, our hearts, and minds. Let the Holy Spirit move in our midst, Lord. We welcome him. May, may you fill us and speak to us today through your servant. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that was shed for our sins, that redeemed us and make us worthy to come and approach your throne, Lord, any time that we need to. And so we ask that you would remove anything that would distract us from worshiping you today. And I, I pray that you would Meet the needs of each family that's represented here. and be, be with those that are not feeling well. Wouldn't make it to join us today. Touch them, Lord, and heal them. With this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. 
unending love, amazing grace. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Everybody cold? Boy, I am too, I'll tell you. Everybody got a ticket? You don't? Okay. Uh, Miss Linda right here. Mr. Joe, She's, he's come. Anyone else? Everybody got a ticket? Uh, right here too, Joe. By Miss Step. All righty. While we're... Um, making sure everybody has a ticket. I got a joke yesterday, so let's see who can answer this. What do you call a 5K race for ministers? Pastor, this is for you. What do you call a 5K race for ministers? Anybody got a guess? How about a rev run? <laughs> rev run, you got it? Jeremy got it. <laughs> All right. What is a flea's favorite way to travel? Itch hiking. Itch hiking. Itch. Okay. Wake up, Brendan. Come on, you're usually you usually have these. Come on. Which bird has the worst manners? Mocking birds. All right, everybody got a ticket? All righty. Well, first, I want to tell you that I've been um, informed of today is a special day. Do you know what today is? Mr. John. Thank you, Pastor. National croissant. National croissant Day. And because he knows it, he gets all the croissants. Yay, John. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, and you know what else today is? Today, what do you say? Prime rib day. Prime rib day. You buying? Uh, we're in. Uh, count me in. It's Miss Anita's birthday. Miss Anita, come on down. Get your tickets ready now. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Our first ticket for flowers. Told you, you get what you pay for. Here you go. All right. Okay, the last three digits. 776. 776. Nobody? Okay. Hey, I see my girl Genesis here today. Hey. 776. Here we go. Nobody got it? Okay. We'll go again. All right. 763. Last three digits. 763. There we go. Good job. Good job. She makes those flowers look good, doesn't she? All right. 
Last three digits, 712, 712. There we go, Mr. Earl, three weeks in a row. You go, Earl. All right. Okay, we're moving on to Valentine's Day. We're going to work our way up in the next couple weeks. So today we're going to start out with candy. And it goes to the last three digits, 735. 735. There, there we go, Miss Rose, 735. You have candy with your croissants this week. All right, last three digits. And I was given this number ahead of start. They told me to pull this number, 768. And it's just by chance, 768. Mr. Scott in the back. There we go. All right. And for our big box of candy today for truffles, our box goes to 755. 755. 755. There we go. Good job. All right. Okay, and um, the Crawfords donated this box of candy. Jim and, um, and his lovely wife, glad to have you back. Miss Judy, thank you. Okay, and it goes to number 762. 762. There we go. Good job. 762. All right. All right, and I want to remind everyone that your giving um, envelopes will be in the back, so you want to catch up those for your taxes at the end of the year. They'll be in the back as you leave today, so you want to make sure you get your envelopes. And we're going to gift cards. Our first one is $25 for Cracker Barrel, and our last three digits are 726. 726. Miss Betty in the back, 726. All right. And our next one is $25 to Bob Evans, and it goes to 732, 732. There we go, on the other side. Good job, 732. And the next one is for Luciano's. It's a $40 gift card, and don't forget, a $50 gift card, I'm sorry, $50 to Luciana's. And don't forget, we're having um, dinner at Luciana's for all that want to go. If you are 60 plus, it's half price. It's usually $45.99, but they're giving us um, a discount for 60 and older. It's going to be $23. So let me know before you leave today if you want to go so that we can um, put you on there. You pay at the restaurant so we don't collect anything ahead of time, but we're going to be at Luciano's at 5 o'clock on the 10th. So if you don't have to be 60 and older to come. You just have to pay full price if you do come. But um, we'd like to have a big crowd. We already have probably about 30 that are going. So it's going to be a good time. 5 o'clock on uh, Thursday, February the 10th at Luciana's. And it's all you can eat, and it is good. So try to come on out and get to know everybody. It's a good chance to uh, fellowship and talk when you have more time in a, a relaxed environment. So, And if you like to eat, which I do, come on out and we'll get lots of good stuff. They have all kinds of meats and they come around and serve it. And uh, my favorite is the, um, uh, I don't know how they do it, baked or pineapple. They cook the pineapple and you come around, they slice a piece off of the whole core. It's delicious. But anyway, enough about that. I'm starving. Okay. All right, so our winner for our Luciana's, next week we'll have two gift cards for Luciana's, so you don't want to miss next week because you'll be able to um, get your coupon before you go on Thursday night. All right, drum roll. Seven, three, three, seven, three, three. There we go, good job. Have a great week and we'll see you. Everybody up through sixth grade, we'll see you in the back. Uh-oh, one more, one more. All right, so uh, for the last couple years, I don't know if we went last year or not, but down in Calvert County, Calvert Baptist Church, they have a hunting thing, which is pretty good. And, uh, normally you get really good food. This year is Randy's Barbecue. It's $15 a person. We will be taking a van if enough people want to ride in the van. If not, a lot of people just show up down there. But I need to know and get a head count who's going. And like I said, it's $15 a person and then have a lot of door prizes. You're pretty much going to get your money back in a door prize. Almost every year I win $40, $50 worth of good stuff. And uh, Mark Crawford, he tore it up last year. He won all kinds of stuff. So anyway, if you want to go, sign up. It's next Saturday. It opens at 5 o'clock. Dinner's at 5.30.
then they normally have a Christian speaker that talks about different hunting stuff, and he talks about God. And it's a really good time for anybody who wants to go. I know we got about 10 men have already asked me about this, so it could be in the back if you want to go sign up. Thank you. Have a good one. Would you be free from your passion? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you worry evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, there's power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin saints are lost in a life-giving flood. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Service for Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily its praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, working, working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Springtime. 
Be seated. Jim, come on up. Jim's going to say a word, and then uh, I'm going to have uh, Chris is going to come up and lead us in prayer. Okay. Uh huh. You know, Pastor mentioned uh, there's going to be a wedding here on February 20th. That's yes. uh, Sunday. Well, February 22nd of the day, I want you to remember. And that's two days later on Tuesday. I'll tell you why in just a minute. But let me just say that um, this year, if anybody who's halfway awake has seen signs out already, that this is election year, right? We know that. Now, we know election years can be kind of confusing because we elect the president uh, on one cycle and we elect the governor on another cycle. This is a year we elect the governor and most all the state offices. And the reason I'm here talking about this this morning is because Pastor mentioned a verse earlier, Romans 8, 28, you know, for we know all things work together for good to them to love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. There may be some folks here today, I hope, that are called according to his purpose to actually consider running for office, especially locally. Now, this year in Maryland, we'll elect a governor, we'll elect one U.S. senator and a congressman. But more importantly, I think most of us understand, especially in the last two years, how much control these elected people have over our lives. I mean, we can see that in the last few years it's been amazing. Well, locally, we will elect five county commissioners here in Charles County, and we'll elect nine school board members. Those are, in my opinion, some of the most important positions out there. We'll also elect the state's attorney and the sheriff and a few other things. But the five county commissioners and the nine school board members are crucial. This country was founded on godly, scriptural, biblical principles. And I think we realize we've gone a long way getting away from those principles over the years. So we're looking for good candidates to step up and run for some of these offices. That uh, Those of us who have Christian values and Christian ethics need to be in those offices. We have people there that are now that are not like that. Now, all the school board and the county commissioners, except for the cha chairman, are actually part-time positions. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, they pay. But uh, county commissioners meet once a week. The school board meets once a month. And, and there's nine members of the school board. 
district we're gonna elect two by district, that gets a little confusing. Anyone who has any inclination or be willing to think about running for county commissioner or school board, especially for any office, I'll be in the back after church. See me then, I'll give you the details, whatever it takes, but think about it and pray about it. Because February 22nd is the last day to sign up and register to run for office. Even though the uh, primary election isn't until June and the general election isn't until November, February 22nd is the last day to sign up to run. So that's why that date's important. See me in the back is less, less than a month away. And um, I'm praying, pray about it, and think about it if you're interested in running for any kind of office. And by the way, any county, uh, that's fine too. I know pretty much whatever, whether it's St. Mary's, Calvary, wherever. Even Virginia had their biggest election last year for their governor, but they'll still elect a congressperson and things like that. So uh, see me in the back afterwards, and I'll be glad to give you any details you need. Pray about it. I'm usually here every week, and I can make it. So. Uh, Hopefully, um, some of you will feel that uh, God may be calling to you for calling you for such a time as this. Thank you. Briefly, um, you know, uh, um, I always call on pastor when I have situations. And uh, when I got out of the Jew house, I've been having problems with transportation. So I enrolled to get my uh, license. And when I uh, actually paid these people, they, first they told me, you can get it in two weeks. So I, I gave the people the money. Pastor Marvin helped me out. And uh, they called me, what was this, Thursday or Friday. He was like, yeah, you got to wait to March. So I was boiling. My spirit, I'm talking about everything gave me. I called Pastor Marvin. He said, oh, let's just pray. And we prayed. And I was like, because I got, I got enrolled into uh, Barber and Cosmetology. I started that on the 8th. And then I'm trying to get this other job in the Iron Union. Or oh, I'm going to be probably working with Brian. But um, I was frustrated, man. And uh, we prayed. And, I, and my spirit was just like, whatever it, whatever it takes. Even if I got to get on the train, you know, I'll do it. But uh, the next day she called me. She was like, we apologize. We know that we told you you had to wait, and due to the COVID, this was the protocol, but they was like, we're going to get you out of the way February the 1st, the 5th, and the, uh, the 4th, the 1st, the 4th, and the 5th. So I should have my license real soon. Pastor blessed me with a car, so God is good, man. And um, sometimes it's, you got to remove yourself. You know, you want to do everything, and it's not, just, it's not always on our time. And so I'm blessed, man. I appreciate the church and all the help. And uh, just stay motivated, man. Jesus, Jesus is the reason. You hear me? So God bless y'all. Amen. I'm going to say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again, gathered in your house, Lord God. We just thank you for everybody that's here and those who wasn't able to make it. We just, just, just sing you a hallelujah, Lord, saying praise your name, Lord. And we just ask that you send us a word that we, that we leave here not the same, Lord God. We will leave here, Lord God, with with just a desire, a, more of a hunger and a more thirst for you, that, Lord God, we may run after you like you run after us, like when you cry, when you die on the cross, sharing your blood, Lord God. So, Lord God, at this moment, Lord, we just ask that you will use the pastor, Lord God, to accomplish your purpose and your will. And we love you and we praise you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Okay, well, I, when I was, I initially got out, I went to prison when I was 15, I got out at the Jew house, they released me. And then Pastor Marvin and Randy, they volunteered to come to the Jew house to actually uh, minister to us on Saturdays. And, um, you know, he come in faithfully, minister the word, and then on Sundays, they allow us to come to the church if you're on a certain level, they allow you to come and stuff like that. And um, I just always felt the pull in my life, you know, to deliver the word of God because you don't go through what you go through for a reason. And I was telling the guys, I, mean, I was telling the ladies, excuse me, I was telling the ladies earlier in a Bible study that that great commission that he'd given us, it's not, it's not something that, you know, you have to be a minister or a deacon or a pastor, but it was the great commission to go out into the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And we living in a world now where the word of God is, is watered down. And it's like, this is the time where we have to minister the word of God because we might be the only Bible that people see, that people can actually see and say, what, what must I do to be saved? You know, so uh, I always felt that pull on my life and uh, he always encouraged me. And I remember that one day we sat down and he was like, God going to use you, you know, and I, and I, I was encouraged by that because uh, I know that not just me, but everybody, everything that we go through in life is for a reason. It's a part that tests us for our testimony, you know, and long as we really accept the call, because you say many are called before I chose, as long as we accept the call, man, skies is the limit, you know. Um, when I got released, I actually thought that I was going to be able to have a job already going, but there was, there was something that I've learned that, you know, everything ain't on my timing, you know, and everybody that I thought that was going to be there for me wasn't there, you know, so I know that my true family is the family of God. The family that pray together, stay together, you know, and always remember that it's not always blood, but the blood of Christ binds us together more than anything, Amen. you know, so uh, just be steadfast and just know, man, that regardless of what, what's, what's chaos is going on in the world, you know, I was telling the people, I was telling the group earlier that we live in a world with lawlessness, you know, and we have to establish the law of God, the principles of God, you know, so that we can teach it to our children and they, and they can teach it to their children because now people just like, they don't really understand or grasp the understanding of what's, what, why we need God. You know, it's not just, we live in a life, we have to have a purpose. You know, and if we don't teach it now, it's going to be forgotten. Like the children of Israel, they had to go through it over and over and over again. But, um, and I like that sign y'all got, that little gold, little, I grabbed one of them. As far as me and my household, we should serve the Lord. And that's something you should put up in your house. Because not only is you showing it to the world, but you reminding yourself. We was talking about, it's crazy, because we was talking about a Bible study, how the Jewish people, they actually wore the mezuzah. They have it on their, on their house, and they wear the robes, and it's a reminder. He said, wear it upon thy neck, so you won't forget, because it's easy. One minute you think about God, the next minute your mind could be altered. So it's easy for your mind to be altered, but you have to put yourself in remembrance. As we went over Proverbs this morning, he said, do not forget. You know, make this be a reminder. Teach it to your children, so it can be rep it's something that's done repetitiously. But the difference between us and our belief and other belief systems, we're not robots. So we serve God out of a love and a desire and a hunger to do his will, you know. So I was saying that that law is not just about rules and regulations, but it's an expression of the love that was already given to us. You know, so we just, we just, we become an offering. We only give him back what he gave us. If that makes sense. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Did you want to mention uh, uh, Gideon's? Sure, now. Right now, come on, let's go with it. <clears throat> I love the Gideon's, by the way. Go ahead. A, a quick one before the Gideon's, reserve February 27th. There's a special speaker coming. We'll have the flyers out next Sunday. But for the Gideons, I'm a member of the local Gideons in Southern Maryland, and we distribute New Testaments with Psalms and Proverbs. Now, I'd like you to think about, uh, I bought 100 of them and I buy boxes to distribute, but I don't just give them away, I give them to witness with them. I give them with a prayer to the people I give them to, because this is the word of God, the most precious thing we could give to another. And in this book, it has a presentation page right at the beginning. So if you like it presented to you, I'll be in the back table to sign and pray with you or, or pastor. And, um, or you can get one to present to somebody else. Make it personal. This is a very personal thing, word of mouth, sharing the Christian faith. Then it has three areas right at the beginning to help us in need, with problems, and then character. The best verses you can find in the New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs.
that are ready reference. Then it's just the plain New Testament, and it ends with the plan of salvation. If a person's not saved, you can get saved by reading the back and signing it. So to make it personal, at the end of the service, we'll be back in the table by the, on your right back there, if you would like one of these for yourselves or for someone else. Praise the Lord. I want to tell you a neat story about the Gideon New Testament. I was a Gideon. I had the privilege to be a Gideon for years. And I went with a friend of mine over to visit his uh, neighbor and uh, who was in the hospital. He was uh, at, um, what's the hospital, the military hospital over in Bethesda? Walter Reed. And he was, his neighbor was having his tongue because of cancer removed the next morning. And so we went over to talk to him, and I'll never forget, I walked into that room, and he was up on one elbow like he was waiting for somebody. And his neighbor and I went in to visit, and we talked to him. And I had that Gideon New Testament, and I shared the gospel with him. And he asked the Lord Jesus to forgive him and save him. And that was a blessing, and I put my name and phone number, and, and we signed his name in the front. And... Uh, <clears throat> He died the next morning on the operating table. Now, I never thought about his family, but uh, about two years later, after midnight, I got a phone call. And it was his brother. And I'll never forget what his brother said to me. By the way, the Gideons pray over every one of those Bibles. And uh, his brother said, uh, are you Marvin Harris? I said, yes. He said, I was going through my brother's uh, duffel bag, and I found this little Gideon New Testament. And he said, uh, <clears throat> down here, it shows that you, you had prayed with him, and he'd asked the Lord to save him on that date. And he said, I'm saved, and I'm backslidden. And he said, all this time, I thought my brother was in hell. And then come to find out he got saved the night before he died. And, uh, and he cried. And he said that uh, he would be in church that next morning. Uh, and I do not know where he lived, but uh, that was a blessing. You can have some of the greatest blessings in your life. You get a couple of those Bibles and pray over them and ask somebody uh, if you can share with them. Amen? Today we're going to look at just a little integrity. A little integrity, and we're going to go to Genesis chapter 6, and uh, nothing like the Word of God, amen? Genesis chapter 6, we're going to read about Noah, and I'm thankful Chris opened us in a word of prayer. Chapter 6, verse 5, <clears throat> and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. The earth and the people were in bad shape. But listen to verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. One man, Noah, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, the power of one. Amen? Amen. We are facing a number of crises in uh, our nation uh, that threaten our very existence as a free and peaceful people. A war is being waged in the hearts of our people, whether we are Christian or heathen. Uh, it, uh, it is a war between deception and truthfulness, loyalty and disloyalty, conviction vices. Convenience, purity vices, perversion, trust, trustworthiness vices, 
treachery or treason, honesty, vices, hypocrisy, integrity seems to be losing or is lost altogether in our country. Military secrets, I think of that all the time. There's always somebody that's uh, uh, been caught selling our secrets. I think about uh, uh, our uh, uh, Congress. Uh, the one fellow had the Chinese girlfriend that was a spy. And, uh, and he's on our intelligence committee. Wedding vows, what's happened to wedding vows? Uh, uh, a person's word has become worthless. Because of the integrity crisis, many a Christian is not sold out for the Lord. James 1.18 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Matthew 6.24 says, no man can serve two masters. Integrity, what does it mean exactly? It is a stubborn and steadfast adherence to strict and moral or ethical codes or convictions. Uh, we need a strong dose of integrity today, don't we? Uh, the Bible reveals a number of insights concerning integrity. Point number one, integrity is the guide for the life of the believer. Proverbs 11.3, the integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Integrity guided Joseph in the latter part of uh, Genesis. He was tempted and tested by his brothers, sold in slavery, managed Potiphar's affairs, tempted by Potiphar's wife, found favor in the prison. I always love reading that for some reason. He says, in prison, one morning he said to the other prisoners, why are you so looking so sadly today? And he's in prison, and he got there because of a lie. But God was using him even in prison. He stood before Pharaoh, giving God the glory and interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. He was promoted above all, and Egypt lay at his feet. He forgave his brothers. That's an amazing story. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Romans 8.28 of the Old Testament, he said that God sent me here to preserve you. You all didn't send me here. God sent me to preserve life. Uh, so his brothers guided. He forgave his brothers and guided and preserved them. Oh, for some more Josephs today. Amen? Amen. Point number two. Uh, the person of integrity fulfills obligations, whether it be required of him or not, or when no one else around is around to observe. You know that story Chris told. Uh, I don't know about you all, but it seems like with my brother-in-law passing and uh, my sister-in-law moving back with it, in with us. Uh, We've been making phone call after phone call trying to help her. And, and even with the hospital thing, she broke both of her shoulders, but there was no place in the hospital for her to stay. They were full. And, um, uh, and then we tried uh, rehabs, and they were all full. And then come to find out that the insurance she had is not that good of insurance. And uh, I think I mentioned that to you, but uh, we have been on the phone nonstop. It's a blessing when somebody calls you back, isn't it? <laughs> if I could tell you all anything, any words of wisdom, write down every name you talk to. Amen. Amen. Try to get a second name if you can. That is a real blessing. But uh, we have been blessed, and, uh, and I realized after a while that God wanted her home with my wife, her sister. Uh, so, um, uh, again, it's, it's a blessing when people call you back. Amen. Amen. And that lady at the DMV called him and, uh, and said, we're going to get this straight because this other person had lied 
about when he would start. But praise God, now he's starting this week. Amen. Jacob, let me back up. Uh, the person with integrity fulfills obligations, whether it uh, be uh, required of him or not, or when no one else is around to observe. I remember a young man, uh, my shop was in Hydesville, Maryland, and a young man from D.C. would come, and I'd work on his car all the time, a young family man. And, uh, and he wrecked his car, and I'd fixed his car several times, and he owed me about $750. I'm telling you this for a reason. And uh, that was a balance on the job I did for him. And he said, Pass, Marvin, I don't have the money now. He said, but I promise you I will get it to you. And... I, that was in the closing days of my shop. I sold the shop in uh, September of 03. And for about a year, I was at home. The shop, my body shop days were over. And uh, that fella called me. And he said, uh, Marvin, he said, uh, the money I owe you, I have for you now. He didn't have to give it back to me. My name was gone. I, I no longer own that shop. But he was a young man of his word. And I'll never forget that. And I was so touched. I said, look, just send me a check for, I think, $300 and forget the rest. I just wanted to bless him because he was blessing me. Amen? It's amazing when we keep our word, uh, our integrity. Jacob, in his early days, couldn't be trusted. But in his later years, he became a man of integrity when famine was in the land and he had sent his sons to buy corn in Egypt. Little did they know they were purchasing the corn from their own brother. Joseph was in charge. And when they brought back their sacks of corn home, they were shocked because the money they had paid out for them was in their bags. That was Amazing, of course, uh, orchestrated by their brother. And we see in Genesis 43, 12, Jacob said, take double the money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Per adventure, it was an oversight. That is called integrity, amen, amen. An unscrupulous salesman was delivering a bid to his company, his company had made for an engineering firm. He was ushered into the office where he would present uh, his bid to the firm. After a brief introduction, the firm's representative, listen to this story, politely excused himself for a minute. The shady salesman quickly noticed the bid of his competitor lying on the desk. Unfortunately, there was a cold drink covering up the total amount of the bid. He gazed out the inner office and noticed there was nobody to see him sneak a peek. He lifted up his, that Pepsi can and got the surprise of his life. Rather than being a cold soda, it was a bottomless can filled with BBs. And quietly, the quiet office suddenly was filled with the sound of BBs racing across the desk and spilling onto the floor. The firm's representative then returned to the office and showed the dishonest salesman the door. That's a good story, isn't it? Be sure your sin will find you out. I've told that to several people this week, and I know it's true. Integrity is demonstrated more when people are not looking than when they are. A friend's wallet years ago, uh, it was missing, and uh, we prayed. And a man said that he was driving down the road, and three times he saw money floating around in the air three times and he stopped and he was catching flying money and uh, and he found the wallet that belonged to my friend and he found his address from a few years ago which was not his current address 
But the man called his son, who was a policeman, and he got the right address, and he delivered his wallet to our friend. Everything was in it. That's integrity, amen? And listen to this. And he refused to take a reward. That's an amazing blessing. What would you do if you found several hundred dollars floating in the air? Would you do, uh, what would you do? Maybe you would say, finders keepers, loser weepers. Is that what you would say? Finders keepers, loser weepers is not in the Bible. Can I get an amen? amen. That was weak. Can I get an amen? amen? Point number three, the person with integrity fulfills his word. Isn't it nice having some people you can count on? Amen. Listen to Proverbs 22, verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Not a blessing. God promised Caleb a mountain uh, And the promise came 40 years later. I think we read that a few weeks ago. God gave it to him. Uh, We had a special family years ago that we loved, Christian family. Dick Larson and his wife, Jane. Dick and Jane. Sound familiar? They were uh, married, and he said, till death do us part. And he was married, they were married for 62 years. Still in love. Still a joy for all of us that knew them. Your integrity, listen to this. Are you all listening to me? Yeah. Okay. Will bless, your integrity will bless your children and your children's children. Are you with me? Phil did a great job, by the way, Wednesday night, talking about investing. If you get a chance, you need to watch that. It was a blessing. I learned more that night in 30 minutes than I probably learned in most of my life, period. But uh, he says, your integrity will bless your children and your children's children. Did you all get that? Listen to this. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The just man walketh in his integrity, and his children are blessed after him. Uh, Sir, your walk will bless your kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. Phil, you gave a verse the other night. I'm sure you had so many you don't remember it, but you talked about uh, our blessings and our, our... money that we would have at the end of our life that we would give out, it actually blesses our children and grandchildren. Do you remember that verse? Yes, that good man leads, uh, Come back up here and say that. Say it loud. I want people to hear it. I like to pick on this guy. <laughs> yeah, it says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, and it's in Proverbs. Amen. Thank you, brother. That's a good verse, isn't it? Praise God. All right. Two opposing candidates were debating on a street corner while a group of spectators looked and listened in. There are hundreds of ways of making money, challenged one, but only one honest way. And his opponent said, and what's that, jeered the other, exalted the first speaker, I knew you wouldn't know, said the second speaker. Did I say that right? I've had more trouble saying that this week. Anyway, he was sure he wouldn't know. Jonathan Edwards, does anybody remember that name? I had a message, was it Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? Written like in 1800s and uh, with the power of God on him. And I believe revival started from that message. And uh, uh, he and his childhood friend um, came up together. 
Uh, John came to Christ, but his friend was an atheist and not interested. Recently, someone went back and looked at the descendants of both of those men. Uh, those two men, Edward's side, not one went to jail of like 50 different descendants. They were in the ministry, many. Uh, also, many were in church work. And his friend, some of them were hung, some were robbers, some were in prison. And, uh, and the, his friend's family cost the state millions where not one dime was spent on Jonathan Edwards' family. I'm here to tell you, God's word is incorruptible seed. Amen? Amen? And we can trust it. And it changes lives. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen. John, uh, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, he said, he must increase, I must decrease. Does anybody remember the name Ted Williams? Not, could I see your hand? Not too many people. That's amazing. A, a great ball player of the past. Amen. Uh, in the Hall of Fame, he was a batting champion. He batted over 300 all but one year in his life. That's an amazing feat. But listen to this. One year in his career. After that year, he went to the management and demanded a $35,000 cut in his pay because he didn't keep up to what he expected himself to do. This must explain why he never batted less than 300 the rest of his life. Can I get one more amen? amen? Isn't that a blessing? Is that integrity or what? Woodrow Wilson said, I'd rather fail in a cause that someday will triumph than to win in a cause that I know someday will fail. I'm here to tell you, as Christians, we need to be steadfast. You need to be a man or woman of integrity. Realize our reasoning can poison our purpose. Leave us frozen spiritually. Lead to treason against God. Take one day, one hour, one minute at a time. Let's be a man or woman of integrity. Amen. Point number three again, uh, the person of integrity fulfills his word. Point number four, the person of integrity is faithful in all areas of his life, especially the small insignificant matters which enables and prepares him for greater matters. And we read in, in Luke 16, 10, he that is faithful in the least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust is the least and is unjust and is unjust in much. The definitions of uh, integrity are complete. Other definitions, sound, perfect condition, uprightness. Job had it right. Uh, he hit a grand slam for us with two verses. Job 25, 27, 5 says, Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. What a great verse. Job 27, 6. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Noah, no doubt about it, we're here today because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And uh, God was, he said it had repented him that he made man in the first place. He was ready to wipe us out. But one man, Noah, God was watching. I'm here to tell you, God is watching you today. There's nothing we do is in the dark with him. Scripture doesn't say uh, that Job was smart or, or, or Noah. He had no degrees hanging on his wall, but it does say he walked with God. God knew he was a man of integrity. 
God could count on him. Can people count on you? Listen to this. God put him to work. Build me an ark. How many carpenters do we have here? Could I see your hand? A couple. How many carpenter wannabes do we have here? Could I see your hand? <laughs> A bunch of you. Imagine this, the orders to build this ark, 450 feet long. That's quite an ark, amen? 45 feet high. I get nervous on a five-foot ladder. How about y'all? 95,700 square feet. Three decks. 1,400,000 cubic feet. A gross tonnage of approximately 13,960 tons. No forklifts. That's amazing. No nail guns. No screw guns. Amen. No unions. No cranes. No silicone. How many here use hard as nails? Has anybody ever heard of that? Boy, you guys, you all are really young, aren't you? Okay. Listen. But he did it. It took him quite a while. And God let him live quite a long time to build this ark. Listen, point number one, integrity is the guide to the life of the believer. Point number two, the person with integrity fulfills his obligations. Point number three, the person with integrity fulfills his words. Point number four, the person with integrity is faithful. Jesus was a man of integrity. He could have called 10,000 angels and said, take me away. But he didn't. On that old rugged cross, Jesus told the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I like this story. Don Calhoun worked for $5 an hour in an office supply company in the outstanding city uh, in, in an outstanding city in Illinois. He had been to two Chicago Bulls basketball games in his life and was about to attend the third. When he entered the stadium, he was approached by a woman who worked for the Bulls organization, and she told him that they selected him to be part in a promotional event during the game called the Million Dollar Shot. The shot came after the timeout in the third quarter of the game. If Mr. Calhoun could shoot a basket standing 79 feet away or behind the free flow line at the other end of the court, he would win a million dollars. Now, Don was no stranger to basketball. He played in the Bloomingdale, uh, Bloomington YMCA. He never tried to shoot like this before he took the ball in his hands and looked over at Michael Jordan and the rest of the Bulls who were rooting for him. And he stepped up to the line and shot the ball. As soon as the ball left his hands, the coach, Phil Jackson, said, it's good. Indeed, the ball went through the basket, a swish. And the crowd went wild. Don was rushed into the arms of Michael Jordan. The team slapped him on the back with congratulations. And Don went home that night with $2 in his pocket. Much like a lot of us have maybe here today. Are you all with me? And he would receive $50,000 a year for the next 20 years. What a blessing. One action, one decision, one moment can change our entire life. Amen. Amen. And this is what happens when you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Trusting him can change your life for all eternity. Yeah. Amen. Maybe some of you here uh, have a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. If there's no power in your life, I would examine you to examine your life. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed.
If you're here today and you've been encouraged by God's word, would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that here? Amen. You can put your hands down. If you're here today and you've never made that life-changing decision to put your faith in the Lord Jesus, I would encourage you to do it today. The Bible tells me about uh, hell, that it's a bottomless pit. It's a place of uh, total darkness. It's a, it's a place where the worm dieth not, where our memories never leave us, uh, those without Christ. Uh, what an awful place hell must be. But heaven, what an amazing place heaven is. And Jesus went to the cross at Calvary, paid our sin debt in full that day, hung there, died for us, and was buried. And three days later, according to the scripture, he arose from the grave alive. If you've never trusted Jesus, today would be a great day in your life. If you would call out to him, he said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We get saved by calling out on that name. If you'll turn from your sin and turn to him and ask him to forgive you and save you, he's promised he will. If you're not sure of heaven today, I would encourage you to pray a simple prayer to the Lord Jesus. Something like this, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Give me eternal life. I now trust you, Jesus, 100% to save me and take me to heaven someday. You said ask, and I'm asking. I now turn from my sins and turn to you. Nobody's looking around. All heads are bowed. Christians are praying. If you've asked Jesus to forgive you and save you today, would you just slip your hand up and put it down? I never embarrass anybody. Amen. I see that hand there. Anybody else? Amen, amen, amen. And praise God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your promise. You said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for dying for us at the cross of Calvary. In your name, Lord Jesus, we ask these things. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you've got a burden on your heart, or maybe this year you have somebody in your life you know needs the Lord, I would encourage you. Let's talk to him. Maybe let's get a Bible from Bill and plan on going over you'll feel so much better, especially knowing that God goes before us when we go to witness to somebody. He's already been there. If you have a person on your heart that you know needs to be saved, would you slip your hand up? Pastor, I know somebody. Hey, Amen. I see several hands here and there. Several hands. Oh, God. In the quietness of this hour, as Christians are praying, we pray for these friends and loved ones of ours. Please, Lord God, uh, save their souls this year before it's eternally too late. As Christians are praying, if you would like to go to this altar and pray for that loved one or that friend, I would encourage you to take that first step. The other steps will be easy. If God's speaking to your heart, take it to the altar, just you and the Lord and ask the Lord to save that person as the choir sings this hymn of invitation. Choir. If God's speaking to your heart, let's step out. So and praise God. There were several hands that went up for salvation. Is calling, calling for you and for me. Waiting and watching
watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling us in. tell you a story. Uh, I had a person on a prayer list for a couple of years and I had been praying for him and we had all been praying for him and uh, I had the privilege to go over to him several times. You've heard me tell the story but uh, he was a very wealthy man and uh, I called someone that was very close to him, that worked with him. And she said to me, "This he prayed and asked the Lord to save him and then died about a week and a half later. And a nurse came to me and she said, Marvin, I'm convinced that our friend was murdered. Murdered. Someone in the family had given him an overdose, she believes, of medicine at the end. And, uh, and she went in to see him that next morning, and he, was, he died right there. Uh, we have evil, wicked forces all around us, don't we? Satan is alive and well and out to destroy people. But I will tell you, if you have a burden for a soul, it's amazing. God will turn heaven around and make it just right so you'll be able to go in and talk to that person. It's amazing uh, how many people we've seen that, that were on their deathbed and uh, uh, seen them turn around. I talked to one guy in the hospital five times, and I cannot think of his name, but he was a good friend of a couple people here. And they told me he was dying, so I went up time number six. And I didn't know if he was going to throw me out of the hospital or listen to me. His name was Nick. He drove a tow truck. Does anybody know that name? Nick drove a tow truck out here. And, uh, and anyway, the day I went in there to talk to him, I thought, well, is he going to throw me out or what? And you know the blessing? I said, Nick, would you like to get saved? He said, yes, sir, I sure would. I'm telling you what, God goes before us. I want to see you all with victory over those people you've been thinking about. We serve a great God, amen? amen? Praise God. I think I'll give you another message this morning. Do you all mind? I don't want to quit. I want, to get ex I want you all to get excited. We've got a great story to tell. There's no greater story ever. Listen, we have some visitors here. I want you to be sure to walk around and... No, the Bible says greet one another with a holy kiss. Don't do it. Don't do it, okay? But it does, we can give them an elbow bump, right? Or a knuckle sandwich. Don't hurt them. Uh, amen. Let's make everybody feel at home, and let's not be in a rush. And uh, I love you guys. And I also want to say thank you for your giving. What a blessing. We've been able to do a whole lot this year because of your giving. Even this new floor. Amen. What a beautiful floor. Amen. And we thank you for everything else. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Let's pray. All right. Okay. Justin, would you lead us?
Amen. Be encouraged.